Thanks. Appreciate you all being here. Uh, so my group and I are really obsessed with protein dynamics. And just to give a, a little bit of background, make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, proteins are these molecular machines that are responsible for many of the active pr processes that we associate with life. life. So everything from muscle contraction to uh, the uh, detection of light in the eye uh, and uh, um, and to perform all these functions, like machines we work with on macroscopic scales that have many moving parts. Uh, but experimentally, often all that we can see are these static snapshots of what a protein typically looks like. Uh, so this is a atomically detailed structure of one of our favorite proteins. So the spheres represent all the atoms in this protein. Uh, and this is a really rich source of information. So we can immediately see what's called the active site. So this pocket where this particular protein catalyzes a chemical reaction. Uh, but again, we know that there's a lot more to the story. So as rich as the information content of this one structure is, it's just the tip of the iceberg. And so one of our specialties is using computer simulations to simulate how every atom protein like this uh, moves over time and improve our understanding of how these machines function and how we can control them. Uh, so for example, here we can see the opening of an unexpected or cryptic pocket, as we call it, uh, that, that we've since uh, shown is implicated in the function of this protein and presents new opportunities for drug design, for example. All right, so these are really powerful approaches. Uh, we've made a lot of success in making quantitative connections with experiments, but they're also extremely computationally demanding. Uh, so simulating the sorts of timescales we would like to capture uh, could easily take hundreds to tens of millions of years, depending on the uh, protein in question, uh, if we were to use a single powerful computer. And, and so one of the things that we and a half dozen other research labs around the world do is uh, run a distributed computing project called Folding at Home, where we uh, ask anyone with a computer and an internet connection to volunteer to help us run simulations on their personal computers and send us back the data. So this is a map showing a pinprick of light where everyone uh, uh, has been participating in uh, folding at home. And at the beginning of 2020, we had about 30,000 devices around the world uh, actively participating in this project, uh, helping us to run calculations that probably would have cost millions of dollars on the cloud uh, by any other means. Um, and so this was an extremely powerful tool. And uh, uh, as it uh, became clear that COVID-19 was going to be, uh, become a pandemic, uh, we realized that we had the opportunity to, to bring this amazing tool to bear to understand all the protein components of the virus and identify new therapeutic opportunities and maybe inform the development of vaccines. Uh, and so at the end of February of this past year, we launched our first simulations of SARS-CoV-2 proteins. Uh, and the response globally was simply amazing. So I uh, remember I said that we had 30,000 devices participating at the beginning of 2020. Uh, here in blue, I'm showing the cumulative downloads of our software over the first few months of the pandemic. And you can see that within the, the first couple of uh, months, we uh, rose to having well over a million devices around the world actively uh, participating in Folding at Home at a, a given time. And so the upshot of this is that Folding at Home became the most powerful supercomputer in the world, uh, the first uh, to measure its performance in uh, units called exaflops. Uh, and, and suffice it to say that we had five times, very conservatively estimate, uh, we had five times the raw computing power of the world's fastest supercomputer at the time, which is the uh, Summit supercomputer in the US. So with all of this compute power, we set to work simulating uh, every protein we could from the viral proteome, as well as other coronaviruses and uh, human proteins that are involved in uh, uh, the immune response or activity of the proteins from the virus. Uh, I don't have time, obviously, to go into all of those, but uh, uh, one of my favorites is our work on the spike. Uh, so as you probably know, going to all of these red protrusions in this canonical image of the virus are uh, called spikes. Uh, each is actually a complex of three proteins. And, and what really fascinated us is that when you see this image, uh, the structure of the spike you see is actually what we call the closed state. So these three proteins are curled up on each other uh, and they're actually burying the interface uh, that is responsible for binding to uh, a protein called ACE2 on a potential host and initiating infection. 
And so as you can imagine, that can't happen in this closed up state that we see. And so somehow these proteins have to open up like the mouth of one of these demogorgon monsters from the uh, television series, Stranger Things, in order to expose uh, this key uh, binding interface uh, to latch on to a potential host. And so the reason this, uh, the virus has this uh, opening and closing is because in the closed state, the virus can hide from being detected by uh, our immune system better than if it was open all the time, uh, exposing this sensitive site. So here I'll just show you a bit of the simulation. Uh, so the three colors here are the three different proteins that make up one spike. Uh, the top left here is tethered to the surface of the virus, and the bottom right is where the spike has to open up in order to uh, bind to a, a human cell, for example. And if we were to tackle this with a conventional simulation, uh, from our perspective, uh, our community's perspective, this is a huge system, uh, 3,600 uh, amino acid residues uh, that make up these proteins. And so all we would see is wiggling around this closed state. But with the power of folding at home, we're actually able to see this uh, dramatic uh, structural change uh, unfold over time, uh, where one of the three protein components opens up quite widely and exposes this surface here that was buried in the closed state, and again, is you know, responsible for binding to ACE2 and initiating infection. So this is really cool because it explains how that interface gets uh, exposed. It also predicts that there's all kinds of other surfaces that actually get exposed uh, uh, by this opening motion. And those are exciting because many could be epitopes for antibodies or the targets of small molecule drugs. Uh, and now we have structural information on what that looks like that we could use to inform the development of vaccines. And we're also building models for all of the emergent variants uh, and trying to understand how they might change the spikes behavior and you know, uh, the, the efficacy of vaccines, for example, and inform the design of new vaccines. Uh, as I said, we've been doing the same sorts of things with every other protein from the virus we can. Uh, all the data is available on uh, AWS and the OSF uh, if you're interested in playing with it. And you can see our bioarchive paper for the links. Uh, with that, I'm extremely grateful for the Folding at Home team, uh, both the scientists uh, spread around the globe and also our volunteers who are even more globally distributed, uh, and all of our funding sources, including the you know, NSF, for their help keeping this going as we struggled at the, the beginning to scale up in response to the uh, massive increase in participation in this project. Thanks.